again coming to you live from the funny farm. So much going on. I almost have my, uh, I've been racing to get my poultry barn done in time for the meat birds that are coming. I think I've got 90 chickens and 20 turkeys coming. Now they weren't supposed to be here until the first week of September and then we just got the call five minutes ago asking if it's okay if we take them early. I guess they have some surplus birds. And that kind of freaks Sarah out because we're not quite ready, but I'll, I'll be ready. <clears throat> I'll get it done. The reason being for me is because a friend of mine who's a butcher and meat shop owner and has been buying pork piglets from the Hutterites in northern BC, I think. Anyway, uh, they informed him the other day that Agriculture Canada has told them to not sell to the public anymore. Those Nazi fucks. So anyway, um, in the back of my mind, I've been wondering, hmm, how long until we can't get the baby little chicks for the meat birds anymore soon, right? So Sarah wanted to push off, say that we couldn't take them, and I'm like, no, we can take them. And <laughs> I guarantee you I'm going to get them. So I just got a funny feeling something's coming down the pipe even farther when it comes to that bullshit, right? From our fascist Canadian government who's in power right now. Hopefully not for too much longer. What else? I usually have a list of shit I want to share with everybody, but I'm running a blank. We have a photograph I got to share right away. I forgot to include the photograph from one of our the original emails in yesterday's uh, new record-breaking email. <laughs> and uh, here's that photograph here. Obviously, that shows one hell of a huge being, right? Uh, what else? Receive text through Sarah to me from our superhero First Nations ladies who want asked for us to be present, me to be present today at a present something going on, something going on with a different topic other than this Sasquatch topic. And for those ladies, I'll drop anything. I'm there. They need support. I'm there. So I got that going on this afternoon. And I get some more updates from them with some other things going on. And for all of you who may be inquiring about the time we had on the back deck, like I said, that was almost three hours of audio that has to be gone through. Yesterday, I read emails yesterday for an hour and a half, which is way over time, and it put me behind and late, just an hour and a half. And you know my talk, I share with you guys everything, where I'm going, what I'm doing. I haven't had three hours to sit down and, and try to edit up that audio yet. I just haven't, I, but I will. What else? Uh, our scientists, our contacts, um, everything's a green, big go, light. All right, everything's fine in that department. Obviously, some people are going to have the odd little hiccup, especially if you're a scientist, man. I mean, I could imagine when you go into that field, you're lifelong, you're gaining shit piles of knowledge, and you know very well that if you gain a whole shit pile of knowledge in the what could be the right direction for you, but the wrong direction for the sleazy bastards in control. They don't dock your pay. They don't demote you. They don't give you a spanking. They don't fire you. They kill you dead. And that's an easily proven fact. They kill you dead. So I can't really judge or come down on our other contacts for getting cold feet and being a little nervous. I'd imagine they should be nervous daily anyway. But we gave the, uh, gave a very, a very clear, um, encouraging email back to clear up any bullshit and everything's fine. And yes, I do have a pile of interesting conversation information to share already. And there's a lot more coming. And nobody's going to stop it. What if I should just share that photograph like that? Let's see if I can. This man emailed in as one of the original emails yesterday. And he showed the height of the thing that was in his view. Now let's see if I can, I can do this. And there is the photo and you can see the man and you can see the red mark he has circled up the trunk of the tree. That's a big son of a bitch creature, right? So I did that in case I get carried away reading and I forget to put that photo in again which isn't hard for me to do. 
What else? I'll give you guys a little bit of a side note. Normally I don't share too much what goes on in other departments, but uh, I was away out of town the other day for the day, and Sarah's here alone and received a text message on her phone. And it scared her. And obviously I go that sent me straight into seek and destroy mode. And it came from the States. Um, uh, don't know how. Uh oh, I just deleted something by accident. Can I get that back? Recently deleted, yes. Thank <laughs> God. Okay, hold on. Uh put that back into the red department, not delete it. Anyways, um, I don't know how, so I've had a few texts hit my personal cell phone from the States. Also, it's related to the topics we share here, and I don't know how my phone number had made it to those people's hands. I will not reply a text to anybody, I don't care who it is. If I haven't given you my phone number and a text comes up on my phone, it's nothing to me. Okay? And it's a little bit of a, not alarming alarming, but it's kind of like, what the, f what's going on, man? My phone number's not out there. Now there's Sarah's. Somehow, apparently they are. So anyways, um, it took me less than an hour to have that phone number dealt with that texted Sarah here when she was alone. Less than an hour through my contacts. Through, I've got some very powerful friends I've met through my guiding career, lifelong friends, and this is in the United States. And it took me less than an hour to ensure that the person who texted is now, instead of trying to make somebody look over the shoulder, now they're looking over the shoulder, for real. So that was very handy, and my thanks go out to my friends, and you know who you are. Thought I'd drop that out there for any of these, any other potential cowards who may be following this channel and may think it might be kind of fun to mess with somebody. It's probably not that good of an idea, okay? Not that good of an idea, not a smart move. Especially if uh, you have bestowed upon you what you tried to inflict on someone else. Right? You thought that would be effective on somebody else because you knew that would be effective on you, and now it is effective on you. Shitty rude awakening that must be. Anyway, getting get some voices heard. And I have to get a little bit of work done on the poultry barn, and then get cleaned up and ready to go to support my First Nations superhero ladies. And then come back and keep this ball rolling. All right, what do we got? This is a real short one. Don't know what this is about, obviously. Market is red. I'm a viewer. This is caught on my ring doorbell. Hi, Steve. Huge intro. Huge into your channel. I've never shared anything to you before until now. I have something that was caught on my ring doorbell and has my hair on end. The ring doorbell was going off a few times and this is what I found after looking at the recording. I've watched this over and over hundreds of times and I can't determine what to believe has been captured on the recording. I'm wondering if you have any ideas or anyone else would have some understanding. Thanks, Eric. Eric, there's nothing there. Oh, there's a video. There's a video attached to this. Now I gotta crack open the email, find the video, download it, save it on Dropbox, or whatever. All right, let's hope I remember, I remember to hit this by the time I get in. That's the shitty thing about saving stuff in my notes on the phone. My phone will not play anything back. I don't know why. Some tech geek will, but I don't know why. So I can't open that right now, and I can't look at it right now while I'm reading. People's voices. <clears throat> Alright, here is a freaking book again. Alright. You guys have seen me come across book size emails in the past, and it's usually towards the end of a little session of hearing voices, and then I pass them. So it's good timing. I've caught this right in the open. A little more gulp of go juice. Here we go. This title. I went hunting the creature that terrorized my family. June 17th, 2022. <clears throat> now. Hey Steve, my name is Gonzalo Chavez. Feel free to use it if necessary. I fear no man, animal, or any authority figure of the known world. Good for you, my brother. Share that courage all around you. 
I'm going to be honest and upfront right now. This is going to be a long documentation of the facts regarding a situation that happened Sunday, the 16th of June 22, 2022, that is, and the hunt I went on Monday, the 17th of June 2022. I'm also going to share some of my experience growing up regarding mainly the supernatural and the white skinny entity shared by one of your other subscribers. Regarding my own experiences, only two other people know about them. I've never really been in being able to share these experiences due to the fact that, well, it's very hard to believe. But I assure you that they are factual and real, but very hard to believe. The main part of this account was told to me by my brother-in-law. He's a no-nonsense type of guy. So I knew it was true just by the reaction from him and the five kids that were with him at the time. One of my kids is my nephew and the other for a basically family. So you understand why I went hunting for this thing that terrorized them that night. I've never been very good at writing or punctuation, so if I screw up, feel free to rip me a new one for mistakes. Let's get into it. First, a description on the location. On the night of the 16th, my brother-in-law and nephew, along with four other children, were fishing at a location called Young's Check, south of Kozad, Nebraska. This is a small gate that controls the flow of water to Johnson's Lake, which is about 10 miles to the east. It's not flat like most people see when traveling through the state. The canal that feeds the lake was built by the Army Corps of Engineers through the hills about 8 miles south of Interstate 80. To keep the flow of water steady and consistent, the canal was carved into the hills. This created many deep ravines and valleys with steep, with steep almost vertical, 50 to 80 foot drop-offs in some areas. Most of the canal is wooded on both sides, so there's plenty of natural cover for anything wanting to move without being seen. As a kid, you could drive right up to the gate, but it's fenced off now. To get back into that area, it's about a half a mile walk to the gate, and another one-tenth of a mile to the spot they were night fishing. The road that leads to the gate runs along the canal with a large cut hill, cutout hillside to the left the whole way. Once there, the cutout canal is extremely steep on each side, with only one way in and one way out. This is the best way I can paint the picture of their location when this thing chased them all the way back to their vehicle. It was about 2.30 a.m. when they were fishing about 200 yards from the east of the gate. They were on a part of the ravine that had carved into the, cha into the canal. That had carved into the canal, which created a small path to hike very close to the water's edge. You cannot travel any further east after this point. Because the walls are 90 degree cutouts directly to the water. They were not at the very point where you could not travel any further. They were at... Alright, I gotta get rid of this chicken. Oh! Tell you what, you want to go on an Easter egg hunt here any day. There's eggs all over this frickin' property. These hens go running around all over the place looking for new secret places to drop them. I don't know why. Now, you cannot travel any further east after this point because the walls are 90 degree cutouts directly to the water. They're at the very point where you could not travel any further. About 15 feet from them to the east is about a five foot round patch of dirt that had fallen also, but it is nearly impossible to get to from east or west. One of the kids thought they heard something making noise in the water near this patch of dirt. So, my brother-in-law shined his light that way, and to their horror, they witnessed an almost disfigured, pale, white creature on all fours drinking out of the canal. It didn't notice them until he shined the light on it. It was so close, it had to know they were there. He said it turned to look at him when he shined the light and said, it had pointed ears, no hair, black eyes, that didn't return the light like any other animal in the wild would. That's alarming. One of the kids later looked up images of skinwalkers when they returned home and said it looked like the one on all fours with the weird disfigured back. He said the one they saw was about 10 times more muscular than the supposed one online. Anyway, back to the account. He, my brother-in-law, turned to the kids and yelled, run now. He then turned back and seen that this creature started coming towards him and he just dropped everything and ran. That's right, he left everything. He didn't have time 
to pack and begin running. Holy shit. He only ran about 15 feet and looked back to see this thing eating the chicken liver they had abandoned, along with a few other items he had no time to grab. It then began to scale the steep drop off going up the hill and was matching their pace as they ran on the road below. They reached the gate. He told the kids to keep running all the way to the truck and get in and don't stop. He wanted to make some distance between this thing and the kids, so he stopped, turned to face this thing so the kids would be safe. Just past the gate and to the left is a power pole that is right up against the hill. He said, when he turned around, it came barreling down the hill and stopped next to the pole and stood up on two legs. The next day, he showed me where the top of the head was next to the pole, almost as if this thing was trying to show him how big it was. Just the head alone reached about eight feet. I'm 5'11", and I had to reach on my toes to the metal bracket where he said the thing's head was clearing. It stood there for about five seconds, which to my brother-in-law must have felt like an eternity. He was only 10 feet from this thing, looking at it eye to eye. Holy effing shit, is what I was thinking when he was telling me. Then it charged him on two legs, and he immediately turned and sprinted down the road to the truck. He said this thing was making grunting noises, and his footfall sounded like it would have to have weighed 600 pounds or better. He said it must have turned and scaled the high wall on the south side of the road because, as he was running, it was running on top of this small cliff right above him. It went off to the right a bit out of sight. He and the kids all said that on the small bend before they reached the truck, they heard what sounded like babies crying to the right in the trees. They all piled into the truck. By this time, two of the kids were crying uncontrollably. He started the truck, and when he turned on the lights, this thing was right across the road behind a tree staring at them. They said its faces changed, and it now looked like it had rags on its face, but still just pale white with black, unreflecting eyes. <clears throat> he showed me where it was standing with its head clearing the top of the tree, and I'm not going to lie, it must have gotten larger. They said they could only see its head and shoulders from behind the tree, and in that location, I couldn't even reach the top of the tree. They peeled out of there, didn't, and it didn't follow them any longer. When they got home, none of the kids could sleep, and one of them sat in the corner holding a cross and a penny, just crying. He wanted to sleep in the closet, keeping the cross and penny in his hands. As he was telling me about this the next day, all I could think was anger. I was going to hunt this thing that terrorized my family. I can relate. So myself, a very good friend, my brother-in-law, and one of the kids, that quite honestly has balls of steel for wanting to go with us, fully armed, up for the night ahead. Not kidding you. Two 12-gauge semi-auto mag-fed shotguns, excuse me, with four 10-round mags loaded with double-odd buck on top and eight Sabo slugs following. One 1911 with extra eight-round mags, one 38 revolver with two quick reloads, one SKS with two 30-round mags, and a bow and arrow set up. A bow and arrow set up. We packed our gear and headed out. <clears throat> my brother-in-law came out around 10 that night after my friend and I, Caden, went exploring. We arrived about an hour before sundown. We scaled the hills past where they were fishing nearly a mile further east. You should have brought some dogs to add to that equipment list, especially if you're going to nighttime. We found an area we could get down to the water and something strange happened. I do not hunt and have never hunted wildlife. I've always been more into target shooting, so I'm not sure if deer act this way. We followed a game trail that steeply snakes down into the ravine. We didn't notice at first the baby deer laying huddled next to a complete 90 degree cutout. We walked right next to this deer and it didn't even, and didn't even see it. It was only after we reached the water and looked back, it was already dark and I noticed the eyes shining in my light. I looked at my buddy and was like, what the F is that? We just, we just walked through there. There's absolutely no, absolutely no other wildlife around other than coyotes we heard in the distance. So I literally walked right up on this two foot tall baby deer, told him not to worry and I wasn't there to harm it. I petted it for about five seconds and it got up and ran away. Okay, just so you guys know, that's not that uncommon, okay? Especially around June, you got brand new fawns and they typically out of, um, 
They are naturally programmed to lie down and don't move as a defense mechanism when they're newborns, and you can walk right up to them and pick them up. All right, so that's not that far-fetched of a detail, just so you guys know. My friend and I looked at each other, couldn't believe what just happened. This is where my brother-in-law came out, and we headed back to where they first seen it. He was leading us around, showing us everywhere this creature traveled. Near the light pole, you could clearly see where, see where something massive had come down the steep embankment. There were fresh clumps of dirt everywhere where it came off the 60 degree plus bank. The grass there was clearly disturbed but couldn't make out any defined prints as the grass is about two feet tall there. We went over to where they were fishing. We picked up the tools that had come out of the tackle box, a $10 bill, a pack of smokes, and a couple other items that were strewn all the way to where they were fishing. They lost these things as they were obviously running for their lives. When we got to the fishing spot, we found one track where the chicken liver was and found what we thought was a barefoot human looking print, 16 plus inches long with three toe imprints, only one. The packaging and the fishing pole holders were gone. So when we went to the edge right before the patch of dirt, there is only about one foot of space to walk the 15 feet to get to the patch of dirt where they first seen it. The water there has an immediate 10 foot drop off because the canal is extremely narrow at this location. Very carefully, myself, my brother-in-law hung on to the crevices in the wall and got to the patch of dirt. The empty package of chicken liver and a fishing pole holder made from steel was bent in half laying right in the middle of this patch. It was like it wanted us to find it there and see what it did to the pole holder. Also, a very important fact was that the liver package wasn't tore apart like a wild animal would do to get the prize inside. The package was fully intact, not damaged in any way, just empty. We made our way off the patch, followed the path. He said it started chasing them on. Near where he seen it eating the liver, we found weird tracks heading up the steep embankment. They were like one and a half inch round holes dug into the dirt about three to four inches deep. They also entered the dirt at about a 20 degree angle and really didn't disturb the dirt around them. It was weird. All these tracks were spaced about four to five feet apart and whatever it was, bipedal or extremely large enough that the 60 degree embankment was no match for it. It just didn't make any logical sense on how these tracks were made. After this, we put out some more liver we brought with us. We put it next to the pole I mentioned earlier and found a good spot by the gate that provided a good bottleneck to make the most of the firepower we had. So it would have to travel 20 feet on the road to get to us, so we would be, so we would have been able to unleash hell on it. Had to come back. We had a clear vantage point to the liver by the pole and waited there in the dark for about an hour. Nothing happened, but Caden said he thought he felt something watching us the entire time. I did not feel this, but then again, I have absolutely no fear of anything, so maybe I didn't pick up on it. This creature, obviously, was very intelligent to do what it did, so if it was just a wild animal in the area looking for a meal, it would have come back tracking the smell of the nasty, stinky liver. While we were sitting there, I asked Caden if at any point he thought it was trying to attack them, and he said no. The feeling he said he had was that it was trying to intimidate and scare them. All the kids ranged in ages 10 to 13, so they understood the gravity of the situation the night prior. This is where the story ends, except for one last piece of information that is puzzling and disturbing at the same time. When we arrive, the gate at the road that blocks entry was open. My brother-in-law said it was closed the night prior. There's absolutely no tracks on the gravel road, human, vehicle, or any tracks of any kind indicating that someone or something opened the gate. When we left and came around the bend, the gate was closed. We all stopped for a second, about 50 feet from the gate, began looking for any kind of track, anything. We slowly shined our lights looking on the ground all the way to the gate and from there all the way to our vehicles and there were no tracks other than our own for when we went in. This makes no logical sense to me. It was open when we went in and closed when we came out. What the F? I went back, proofread what I have written and wow it's long. I'll try to be brief for the next couple of items. This is nothing man. <laughs> this is easy. Because of the things I've seen, when in a state of what science will tell you is sleep paralysis, 
That is a completely obvious cover title to what it really is. I know what they described is real. We found the evidence of the path it took, some of the tracks it made, and the ground disturbances it created. I've seen this creature in my parents' home when I was 20 years old while on leave from service stationed in Washington State. It was obviously in a smaller form and on a different plane of existence at that time, but it was identical to what they described. It was also there to intimidate and scare me. I didn't have the feeling that it was trying to harm me, just like Caden said, he felt like he was trying to harm them that night. Long ago, I was able to control what they call sleep paralysis and enter it at will any time I wanted to. Holy shit. You'd not believe the things I've seen in that realm. It, is, it does manifest in this realm from that realm. That's a fact, and I have a witness that can verify that. I taught him how to enter sleep paralysis, and that very night we had a weird encounter out in the woods of Montana where we were working. On the drive to the job site, he tried what I showed him to do to enter that state while he took a nap. When he woke up, he told me that he never wanted to ever do that again. Later that night, he had to take the water truck down to the mountain to get more water for our drilling rig. And on the way back in, he said he thought what he saw in sleep paralysis was following him. At that very moment, every single light on the truck went out, complete darkness. This type of truck will die if it loses power, so the fact that it was still running verified to me that something was definitely messing with us. I stopped the truck as fast as I could and told my buddy, who was freaking out, to tell it to leave him alone with authority in his voice. And he yelled out, leave me alone. And immediately all the lights came back on. And this is just one of nearly a hundred or more things I've experienced over the years. One time, while experimenting with sleep paralysis, something came right up to my right ear and said, and I quote, you need to stop doing this now, and it vanished. I think back to one of the accounts you read a while back when your subscribers were talking about how we are pure energy, and that these creatures are energy, but not pure energy, and he's right. When I was about six years old, I experienced this form of energy, but it was as if I'd been kicked out of the club but so badly wanted to return to what I knew we really were. That's when my sleep paralysis began, by the way. It started with one nightmare, floating in an abyss of absolute darkness and huge balls of energy floating past me. It felt like they were trying to draw me in, but I didn't quite understand what they were at the time. After that night, I struggled every night with sleep paralysis until I was about 15 years old. It was then that I learned how to control it. I'm still very afraid of it. When I was about 19, just before I entered the Navy, I decided to no longer fear it, and that's when the fun began. Well, I'm sure terrifying to anyone else, but I was already used to it. So, to lose the fear that was gripping me as a child was a new exhilarating experience for me. I've had many encounters in that state, and everything I encountered had intent. Some good, some bad, and some just outright evil. I've seen giant serpent-like creatures, the skinny pale white figure, a child running at me with a head that turned into a head full of teeth, and the worst ones are the black cloud looking things that just hover near the ceiling in your room. Those ones emanate pure evil, and when something told me I needed to stop doing this now, there was one of them on the other side of the room when it happened. Now you might have an idea of why I went to hunt this thing that terrorized my family. I absolutely do not fear any of these creatures. I know if it's going to get me, it has the strength, the power, the agility, and ferocity to get me, or anyone for that matter. Also, I've been able to fend them off with just knowing that I possess the power of authority from our Creator, and using that knowledge to just tell them off with authority in my voice. This event with my family was different, though. This event with my family was different, though. I wanted it to know that I would fight it with everything I had in me, to not mess with the ones I love, and... If it wanted to manifest itself in the physical world, then it would also have to accept the fact that I would fight it by physical means and pump as much physical lead into it before it killed me. I also do not fear death. This is key for everyone. It's the door to life and I look forward to it. I kind of do too, but not quite just yet. But I'm, I'm definitely anticipating that adventure. For sure. Thanks, Steve, and thank you for all the other brothers and sisters out there who have had the courage to come out and share their experiences. 
This world that we experience is, I'm guessing, only about 10% of what's really around us at any given moment. We have been lied to since the day we left the womb. Yes, we have. 110% we have. Keep spreading the things to people. Keep spreading the things people are too afraid to share to help heal our souls and give back to who we truly are. We have powers and abilities most people can't even fathom because we've been nurtured from day one. I was only able to harness one ability of, prob of probably an infinite number of abilities we truly have but do not, but don't, do know it? Don't know it. I was only able to harness one ability of probably an infinite number of abilities we truly have but don't know it. I lost the ability to enter I lost the ability to enter sleep paralysis in my 30s and have been trying to get it back. I'm 40 now and hope to one day reharness that power. Knowing now what I know and hearing all the stories of others you have shared has renewed a fire in my spirit to take the fight to them on their turf. I love you all. There we go. That is one hell of a share, Gonzalo. And uh, why do I know that name? I know that name. You've been mentioned to me in another email. Somebody out there, I think, wanted to mail me something when it comes to you guys, I think. Nothing's arrived in the mail, so you know. Uh, Okay, sleep paralysis, teaching somebody how. I want to know how. If you could, if you would, if you got the time, Gonzalo, email me as best you can the description of how you harness that skill. I want to know. I'm down. If you would. Or not. It's fine too, but I'm down. And Gonzalo directed to you too. I mean, if you guys or you or anybody you know can harness anything, like what you similar to what you mentioned and direct your direct your attack so to speak on some of these beings you described is there any way that those skills can be directed at the the living beings who are having an absolute negative impact on the human race today and we all know who those most of those names are my question is is there any way that Possibly someone with the skills that you have had or have for anyone you know can do something about this shit show. That would be my, so I don't know why that's what first popped into my head. Um, now, another thing for me being the professional hunter that I have been, um, I learn everything I can about every game animal I've ever gone after, and I eat every one of them, except when it's predator management. Uh, when I hear of anybody sharing, you know, like whatever beings are brought up on this channel, if they have to drink water, all right, I don't care what the description of the being is, if it is drinking water, that thing's going to die from a hole in it. That's all there's to it. That's no special, that is a sign to me that that is no special character when it comes to breathing and eating and having to drink water. Anything that has to drink water, you put a hole in it, it's going to die, right? And then as well, we've had numerous accounts, re, accounts of whatever being you might want to talk about, Sasquatch, Dogman, whatever, these things have to breathe. They, they, they need oxygen to go in them to make sound come out of their mouth, right? Just thinking rational thinking. That tells me that you put a hole in that being, it's going to die, right? So it makes, so that's what can also make my mind hit a little bit of a confusing wall when it comes to the abilities of some of these beings. It's like, okay, wait a minute. So you guys got to breathe oxygen and you got to drink water? Yeah, you can, you can vanish. That's confusing for me because if you can breathe, if you need oxygen, I could kill your ass if I had to. If the body that you're in needs to drink water to operate, I can definitely kill your ass if I had to, if that situation arose, right? Not saying I'm seeking anything out to kill it. I'm just using my common sense thinking, right? It's, it can, uh, there's a few items going on with a lot of these beings being reported that is confusing to me. Confusing. They are somewhat similar to us 
with their weaknesses of, and that includes breathing oxygen, needing water, needing to eat. So that tells me they're just, they're very, very similar to us and we can kill each other like nothing, right? Physically, we can kill our physical bodies easily. I don't know about our soul, but all right, let me not, my, my brain seems to slip out my mouth as thoughts come to it. <laughs> I got to get back to, to, to listening to people. We got to get back to hearing the people. All right. What's this one? That's an interesting share, man. That's an absolute interesting share. You just shared with us. Thank you so much for that. Appreciate your time. And um, anybody out there shaking their head, well, take from it what you will or leave it. But imagine, imagine waking up in the morning and thinking to yourself, hmm, I'm so bored and I need some attention so badly. I think I'm going to make this up. And then smoothly write down that last email and deliver it. Okay? Picture. Picture that end of it. It's not too easy to picture that and make sense of that move, would it? Nicotating membrane in Sasquatch family and the old log scaling station. Hello, Steve. Thanks for all you do to help put pieces together for all of us. I was amazed to hear the 73-year-old retired Oregon biologist details of the nicotating membranes in the eyes of the adult Sasquatch observed southeast of Estacada, Estacada in 2004. I've not ever published an account shared by a Revilla Island, Alaska woman dated several decades ago, but we'll give you the basic details. The woman was returning by car one night on the Harriet Hunt Lake Highway, which passes by Ward Lake. She had to stop and pull over beside a berm covered in alder saplings some 12 feet tall that would conceal her at the top of the berm to attend to her business. The time was around midnight and she said that it was quiet and there was some ambient light in the sky from nearby Ward Cove. As she finished her business and was preparing to stand and step down off the berm, she was amazed to see a Sasquatch crouched just 10 to 15 feet away. Also in the alders, in the top of the berm, intently staring at her. They just stare at each other. She said, for about a minute, not more. Okay, picture that one. Time a minute now. One minute in, in those moments is like a lifetime. One minute for me and a face-to-face -face, uh, big game animal close up encounter, one minute is hours. All right, picture that one. She couldn't see his face clearly. She said, it didn't seem aggressive, just curious. And she added, there was something very strange about its eyes. She said she noticed a membrane that came from the edge of the eyelids, but was not an eyelid. Sort of like what some animals have that covered what in humans is the white of the eye, but it was pinkish. She turned away, quickly stepped down through the alders to her car, but it, didn't, but it did not move from where it had been crouching. She said she had not reported her encounter to anyone because not only were the circumstances embarrassing, but who would believe it? I would. I have her entire story along with hundreds of others, which I've been working through to put together for my personal study on Sasquatches in Alaska, but never had I heard of this detail. That is until you read the Oregon biologist's email. His guess that the membrane could be a function of protection from daylight during daytime, but I wonder if the pink or red might also have a benefit for nocturnal vision where the red filters can enhance light night vision without exhausting the retinas rods required for night vision. Perhaps there is a function that would allow the eye to, to be more sensitive to infrared and to be able to pick out heat signature over great distances. I really don't know, but it has me wondering. Although there is much in the electromagnetic spectrum about Sasquatches that is suggested by not just eye contact, but also by the native admon admonition not to look them directly in the eyes. You may use my name. Thanks again for all you do, and thanks to all the tens of thousands of those sharing in this club of no return. Together, we can put our pieces into this puzzle that we all find ourselves part of. J. Robert Alley. Thank you, man. Appreciate you. I think you sent me a book. And uh, 
please keep sharing with us. All right, man? Keep sharing. Keep sharing. Appreciate you. That's interesting, isn't it? That's very, very interesting. Uh, yeah, very interesting. Um, holy cow, here is a book. Another book. Uh, what am I going to do with this? Is it how late are we? I really cannot sit here for more time than I allow. I am just getting the... Uh, I'm just going, all right, I'm going to save that book for another time. It's too long for right now. I got too much going on, you guys. I have to get ready for these meat, chickens, and turkeys. And I have to, have to go and support my First Nation superhero woman today. And then tomorrow I can get hopefully get into a book. All right, what's this one? How long is this? This is manageable. <laughs> this is titled Crazy Day. That seems to be the theme of my entire every day. All right. Hi, Steve. First off, great channel. So my story or experience starts off a day's ride on horseback from a place not too many people have heard of being Goldbridge, B.C. Here we go. My old backyard. There's a handful of us that have had experiences all around there. Population about 75 people, and that's counting their dogs, lol. It's small and way the hell out in God's country. I was guiding up there, I won't say for who, but you probably know. Yep, I know. And we had six women, all the doctor, lawyer type ladies. Day and a half from Goldbridge, springtime, a little bit of snow here and there. And we we're on the beaten trail with me in front, in the front lead horse. I could hear something to my right in the alpine trees. My horse sensed it. Her name is Leah. She was watching to the right and the left down the hill. Something was out there, and very so often Leah would just stop, perk her ears, a little nudge, and she would carry on. The trail we were on was beaten, and Sandy and I noticed a, a fresh, very fresh black bear tracks. The tracks stayed on the path for a few minutes, then beside the bear tracks, a human bear foot. It appeared to be following the bear. The footprints, not really big, I would say size 11 or 12, and kinda wide, strange shape in a way, but I thought to myself, what the hell? Oh man, one day I'm gonna be in a land of no helicopters. One day, somewhere. There's gotta be somewhere left in this planet where these pricks aren't flying around all over the place. Has to be. <laughs> mm -mm -mm. Token helicopter every time, right? And if you think they're flying due to me, Give your head a shake. That's not the case. I thought to myself, what the hell? There's no way a person could be up here a day and a half ride from Goldbridge and another three hours from there to the next small town, Lillooet. We are way the hell up in the Alpine and so far from civilization, but here they are, springtime and human-like prints following this bear. I didn't point the bear track to the clients, normally I would as they are paying big money for the wild nature experience, and to point out a bear track, then to point out what looks like human bear feet. Well, that would just scare the loving shit out of them, I'm sure. To be honest, it had me a little concerned as well. Another hundred yards or so, the bear and footprint seemed to veer to the left, down the hill to a long meadow, with pine and spruce tree thick forest on to the side. About three minutes later, I hear a hell of a racket. Trees being broke, sounded like an elephant was in the bush down to our left, and sure as shit, out comes a great big black bear running out of the bush full speed, and it was scared, really scared. As it ran, it kept looking back as if something was chasing it. But whatever it was, that bear wanted nothing to do with, and as it ran by us 100 yards away, I could see on its left hind quarter it had a dinner size plate chunk of hair missing. Like the hair had been just ripped right out. Not a bite mark, and didn't look like a, a wound from another bear claws, just a full size chunk of hair missing. A little bit of blood, 
but mostly pink flesh, and obviously it was very recent. Well, that's interesting, because at first I was going to say, well, it was rubbing. Springtime, they rubbed their fur off, but not if it's pink with blood. Now, I've been hunting and guiding for bear a lot. I kind of know them pretty good. I was, when I was 11, I'd received my first gun, an old Kentucky cap lock, and I was chased up a tree along with my cuz and saw some, and a sow with a cub put the run on us in a cow field. One big bull pine, one big pissed off sow, and one cub, two young kids running for, for the only safety around. Cuz dropped his 22, he had no sling. Oh, I gotta rub my eye. Something is in my eye. Sorry, guys. Damn. <clears throat> A little bit of punctuation missing here, all right? Dropped his 22. He had no sling. Up he goes. I'm right on his ass, but I had a sling. Up we went 25 feet or so, and here she comes after us. I just reloaded before we got chased. And as she started to climb, I lowered that old Kentucky with one hand, the other hand, death grip on a branch, and waited till she moved to the left, a foot, about eight feet from me, and let her have the only shot I was going to get. So after that, I had a few more close calls and learned to read them some. So about that big boar running for its life, I'm suspecting that there was three Sasquatches. You're one on the trail right behind him. You're one. Probably meant one on the trail right behind him. Two others flanking both sides. And an ambush awaits Yogi. Got lucky, I think. And I won't soon forget that day. An ambush awaits Yogi. Got lucky, I think. And won't soon forget that day. Neither will I. Or the three other guides. I'd never seen anything like it, and those rich women clients, they thought it was spectacular. The night the bear came up to night, the number two, then night, the bear came up in late evening. Chat, and I let on what I thought you could of hers, porcupine fart, about three to four minutes of silence as they all took in the reality of the situation. The day before, even the two other guys looked a little pale. Thanks to you for reading my experience. I only told one other about this, and feel free to use my name, Robert Falconer. By the way, I'm a big fan. Keep the stories coming. Okay, Robert, got a little, little scratchy at the end there, but we got it. And that country you're in, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with me and what I've been doing, but I've, I think I've, I don't know how many wolves are trapped around Gold Bridge. Probably 40 or 50 of them around there. So I'm very, and I've hunted around there a bit, not too much. I'm not. There's too many people who hunt deer around there. So I don't really, I don't hunt, I don't really go where people go during hunting season, but I spend a lot of time in the mountains around there in the wintertime. And we also have some people here who have seen these beings around there lots. Um, the sightings, Gold Bridge is just up over the hill from where I lived previously for the last 15 years, you guys. And the stand, remember the stand of the swamp, that's just up and over the hill to next valley over, basically. It's a little bit of a jaunt, 45 minutes, but that's where the stand is. You leave the stand, drive over the head of land, boom, you end up in Gold Bridge. And uh, obviously the sightings all around there, all around Lillooet, especially around Lillooet, especially between Lillooet and, oh, what's that ranch? Damn it, the ranch on the way to, no, the ranch on the way to Cash Creek on the right. I trapped wolves for that rancher before too. And there's a shit pile of stuff going on around there. And that's also where our friends who generously sent me the bone, the bear bones. He sent me bones that were left for him, always the same bone of the form of a bear. They left, the Sasquatches left for him when he was hunting bear on a trail in the same rock. And he shipped those to me in a bag, but one bone is huge. And I really do need to get the DNA done on that bone, I think. I'm babbling. I'm just saying there's a lot going on around there. Always has been, always will be. And uh, yeah, it's interesting. I didn't know, I knew that you guys did pack trips out of there, just plain horseback pack trips. And you, and I know why you didn't mention that person's name either, because he's always been a controversial figure when it comes to outfitting and horses with not that good a reputation. But I didn't know you guys did rides that direction. 
overnight pack trips. But anyway, I thought you guys were more, more, uh, yeah, whatever, unrelated to this topic. Let's carry on. Let's carry on and get some more voices heard, a little more go juice in me. Now, about the ambush thing too, like I've said a million times, these beings don't need to ambush anything. They just don't. May come across to us as an ambush, not a chance. They can just come up and grab you anytime they want, or grab whatever they want anytime. All right, this is titled, <clears throat> Bigfoot Wrecked My Life and Got Me Locked Up. Hi, Steve, hope you're well, and I hope you can share my story. It happened many years ago. My home life as a child was very bad and violent, to say the least. I even had the horror of watching my father. Oh, okay. All right, I'll read it. I even had the horror of watching my father kill an unborn baby in my mother's belly by kicking her. Enough that at the age of 17, I... Enough of that. At the age of 17, I'm 60 now. That's dark. That's unfortunate. I used to hunt and fish to avoid being home. I was out to snag a deer and was not very lucky as I was almost out of the area of my regular hunting spot in the Plaster Rock NB. I could smell this sort of skunk and rotten onion so strong you could taste it. I was just rounding the bend of the trail and was about to release the hammer for the firing pin slowly, take out the clip, and then empty the chamber. I was very sure there was a big old bear handy. That is how I chose to take my ammo out. Out of nowhere, I heard these what sounded like the biggest footfalls ever, and in a split second, there it was. 10, maybe 12 feet in front of me, and it was at least 10 feet tall. I pointed upwards and fired, pure reflex, nothing, but it went down. My gun was a very old 270, it struggled to get up. At that time, I shot it again and put it back down. He could not get back up, so I finished him with a round to the head. The first shot I fired was a through and through, taking one hell of a bunch of entrails and flesh out. The shot itself was by fluke, almost center mass. Steve, this, these things are very real, and I know what I killed, and it was not a person or a bear, it was a Bigfoot. I told my folks, and they said I was on drugs, and I was the reason for Dad being a violent drunk and had me placed in cent Central Care, Centera Care, which was a very abusive nut house in St. John's, New Brunswick. The treatment in there effed me up even worse. They at first told me I was trying to hide a murder, then they asked me to show them the body. I do not trust, so I never did. I figured if I did, I'd go to prison for one, either killing an almost extinct animal of a gorilla that escaped from some place, or a gorilla that escaped from some place, so they decided shock treatment would help. I guess it did. I got out of there and went to prison anyway for car theft, 39 months. All I can say is, Steve, you're doing the right thing with your channel. Please be careful of the government here in Canada. Steve, they are deadly. Mike H. There is quite the handful. That's quite the, quite the handful to share there, Mike. The dark part of that story is very unfortunate. Very, very unfortunate. And to come here and share with the world that you shot and killed one of these beings... You know how the reaction is going to go down in the comment section below, right? The crowd's going to go nuts on your ass. A lot of people are going to say no effing way. A lot of people are going to be saying, show us, share us more, share more, give us a description, whatever, right? So there you go, you guys. Take from away will or leave it. And you are hearing exactly what I'm reading for the first time ever as we go. All right, I'm going to go one more. It's titled Sasquatch Breaking a Tree. Hey Steve, I have what I believe to be three encounters to share. I live in the western middle Tennessee area near the Tennessee River. Just call me AJ. What I believe to be my first encounter happened to me around age 10, I'm 54 now. So this is around 1978. And I was walking out in the woods near a creek that ran behind our house. 
the further I got away from our house, I began feeling as though I was going to be sick to my stomach. All of a sudden, I was overcome with fear that I could not explain, and then I heard this. Two short whoop whoops, followed by a two-toned, two-syllable whistle, followed by another. I stopped in my tracks. I yelled out, hello? No response. After a few seconds, the whoops and whistles happened again, then again. I started heading back toward my house and I could hear sounds of what reminded me of an aluminum baseball bat striking something over and over. This continued until I reached the edge of our property. Being 10 at the time, I thought nothing of it other than my imagination getting the best of me. My second encounter happened to me when I was around the age of 15. At this age, I was always riding my ATV on nearby logging roads and trails. I do this almost on a daily basis. If I wasn't riding them, I was walking them. At this age, when I was walking them, I was also armed with either my Marlin 3030, my Browning 410, or my Remington 22. On this day, I did not recall which gun I had. The reason I walked with the gun was in case I came across a snake or if I was able to practice shooting at random targets. I was deep within the woods on a logging road about two miles from my house. This opened up into a cleared field that I used for hunting in deer season. As I entered the clearing, I was scanning the area. What caught my attention was a rather tall tree across the field. The top of the tree had quite a bit of movement going back and forth and shaking. I thought at first there were squirrels chasing each other, jumping from limb to limb. I made my way towards the tree. My attention was still focused on trying to see what was up in it. I got about 50 yards from the tree and still couldn't see what was in it, nor the base of the tree. As I approached the tree, I got to where the base of the tree was becoming exposed. I got about 30 feet from the tree when I saw what was making the movement at the top of the tree. I saw a very large hairy arm and shoulder appear to the left of the tree and was grasping the tree from behind. I saw the black left portion of this being moving side to side with the tree in its grasp. I was in disbelief as to what I was seeing and I yelled, Hey! thinking someone or something might respond. I got no response, and with a gun in my hand, for whatever reason, the thought to use it never occurred to me. I, I never saw the front or the head of this being. I don't recall seeing any other portion of this thing other than the left arm, shoulder, and hand. The hair was reddish brown in color. A couple of things that stood out was that there was a group of longer hairs that appeared bundled together, hanging down from the elbow. This reminded me of a turkey's beard. The skin was not visible on the shoulder or arm, but appeared sort of gray on the hand. That's consistent, isn't it? Grayish colored skin. That is a description probably 99.9% .9 of the time. The hand had hair, but the skin was visible. The thumb appeared to be injured or deformed. It was a very bright reddish purple and appeared swollen from the other digits. That's all I remember from that encounter. I never felt dread. I never smelled any unpleasant odor. I did smell a very, very dominant wood scent as if at a lumber mill. My memory from that encounter ends there. I'm not really sure what to make of anything else of it other than when I returned return home the rest of the day. I did not think anything about it. The next day I started tracing my thoughts the previous day and realized that I could not account for a few hours. I am not sure if my mind was in a fog. I decided to ride my ATV back to the location of the tree, and that tree was broken over exactly where this thing's shoulder was. Well, so much for them being protectors of the forest, right? I always get a kick out of that when people say, they're the protectors of the forest. Well, why do they keep breaking trees in half? Well, uh, contradicting, isn't it? I did not see it break the tree, but it was broken when I returned to it. It was still there, just broken. At the time, I did not try to judge the height of where the break occurred. I just know that the portion of this thing, the portion of the thing I saw was much larger than any human. The size of the break in the tree was comparable to the size of a bowling ball. It is still so strange how I felt in a fog, even the days following it, and trying to process what happened and how it unfolded. My third encounter happened when I was 18. I'd been at a gathering of friends out at the river. It was getting late, so I decided to leave. 
I was about three miles from the cabin on the river when I lost control of my car and spun it around and off in a ditch on the side of the gravel road. I could not get it out of the ditch. There were still a few people that hadn't left the party yet, so I thought I'd walk back to the cabin, hitch a ride back toward town or to my house. It was a very bright starlit night. As I started walking, I heard something keeping step with me to my right. All of a sudden, I had this sickening feeling and dread came over me. I yelled out, who's there? I got no reply. It was at the time the most fearful moment of my life. I began to run. Now this thing was not only keeping step with me, but as when I had my first encounter, there were two short whoops and one two-toned, two-syllable whistles. This went on for at least a half of a mile and then it just suddenly stopped. Where I heard the movement and the sound seemed to be within 20 or 30 yards of me, but it's hard to say for sure. I never saw or smelled anything, but I know what I heard and I know what I felt. Well, that's my story. It happened so long ago, but as I stumbled upon your channel, I felt I should share my experience. Appreciate what you're doing, and I hope that it will lead to people being a little more open-minded as to what is really occurring out there and how we as a people, the human race, is being controlled to believe what our governments want us to believe regards AJ. So true, and another person enters the club on a return and has the same thoughts many of us do. Once you're slapped in the face with this fact, then you question everything, and then you start seeing the, the absolute facts. It just leads to truth, left, right, and center. Hard truth to swallow for most of us. But the truth is that we have been misled and absolutely suppressed, miseducated, all in the wrong direction. And it kind of sucks ass, right? But, like you say, you just shared your email hoping it's going to help somebody. You did, without a doubt. Every single email that comes in helps who knows how many who knows how many people are sitting on the fence. The fence overlooking the round table of knowledge, right? The club of no return. I wonder how many members of the club are sitting on the fence right now. There's got to be who knows how many. Right? I mean over over was it close to five million views just on this channel alone? The other, my other channels got around 4 million or something views this past few weeks. Just in a few weeks, right? So there's a, there's a small handful of people out there interested in the truth, watching this channel, and who knows how many people are sitting on the fence struggling with either whether they will or not or how they're going to share their story. And many of people out there think that it's too much and nobody's going to believe you. Well, get over it because there is a ship pile of people here ready to embrace it, listen to it, and deal with it, and help you deal with it, all right? Now, what else? Obviously, the members of the pricks who don't want you to know anything, they're here too. 110% you little slimy weasels are here too. Slimy little weasels. Yes, that's what you are. And who else is here? Well, enough about that. I gotta go. I'm babbling. I'm in a bit of a fight mode today. I feel protective of my First Nations superhero ladies. Their story that they are sharing today has got me growling. Um, somebody uh, thinking they're a toy with texting or terrorizing someone close to me, that's got me growling. And for any, if there are some cowards out there listening right now, make sure when you go to fight, if you want to pick a fight with somebody, make sure you're doing the right thing for you because whatever you want to bestow upon someone else is going to happen to you. Probably worse, right? Don't be a coward. Don't be a coward. Don't tolerate cowards and expose them. All right, you guys? It's a very, very, very strong group here. <laughs> it's a very, very, very strong, large, vast group here. Anyway. Coffee's really kicking in today, isn't it? I've got to get my ass in gear. Big time. I feel panicky this whole, this whole month. I typically feel panicky because it's just come up to a head where I have, I have got to go back to the mountains. I haven't even started dragging out all my gear yet, and I have to. I promised I would 
make some videos of the gear I'm going to bring for the other channel, the How to Hunt channel. Share with everybody what I do, how I sleep, what I bring with me. A uh, quick more note on that topic, just to get, I, I, just, I get a lot of people emailing me about my guns and what I pack. And I'm not a gun guy, you guys, I'm not a gun guy. I know how to use them. Um, I know how to use them. I'm not into reloading, so I just don't shoot enough to do that. Um, my main go-to rifle, at a, which I hunt with up north when I use a rifle, is a 300 short mag. That's what I use. My gun's done everything from grizzly bears to, to deer, you name it. Um, I also have another rifle that I used to carry as a side, side weapon guiding, a 300 Ultra Mag, which is basically a small missile launcher. And I don't bring that gun because it's just too heavy. It's a very, very heavy rifle. What else do I have? I got all sorts of toys. But you never show your cards publicly, right? Be safe out there. Make sure you guys email me, all right? Get it off your chest. All you, who knows, I don't know, out of millions of people, how many tens, is there tens of thousands? Is there hundreds of thousands of people sitting on the fence watching this channel? I don't know. It's becoming more probable. And uh, I don't know what you're waiting for. Just do it. Just share what you got. Share what you got. And all you people who know truth and you're scared to share it, quit being scared. Quit being scared. All right? Those pricks who feel that they can know, but you can't know, they need you to be scared. And if you're not scared, they're nothing, <laughs> okay? If you're not scared, the little slimy weasels are nothing. They're nothing anyway. Take it back, man. Take the power back. Just don't be scared of anybody or anything.